You give us a good morning also. Let Sharif know, give him some love. That's Sharif great. is sensitive. He wants, we want to make sure he feels the love. <laughs> hey, Lisa, oh, look at that. I got my favorite yoga teacher. Uh, Sharif, I know you exercise. I actually got my favorite yoga teacher. I did yoga this morning and Lisa's actually on board today too. So oh, welcome. That's nice. You do yoga? I didn't know. I, I just started, you would think. <laughs> Trying to free up the mind, right? You got to keep busy with, you know, obviously with COVID and everything else that's happening out there. So um, good morning. Oh, look at that. She even said I did great. I don't know if you would have saw me, Sharif. <laughs> I just realized how not flexible I am. It's a challenge. Is an understatement. <laughs> good morning, guys. Good morning. What's up, Harry? How are you? Diana, Taryn, Juan. Maybe, maybe my yoga teacher will take it easy on me on Thursday. Okay, so <laughs> I know you you're in fitness, aren't you? I know you're in good shape, Sharif. You work out and play volleyball. Yes, yes, I work out lots of volleyball. Doing some weights every now and then. All right. Absolutely. So welcome guys. Welcome to it's Tuesday, October 20th. Um, you know, give us a few minutes. We'll get started. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. And Lisa plays volleyball too. So, oh, that's great. She's my yoga teacher, not only does she plays volleyball, does yoga, all the above. So welcome guys. Good morning. Good morning. Give it another two or three more minutes before we get Sharif going a little bit today. Antonio, hey, good morning. I see you. Dave Huntsman, what's up, Dave? I see a lot of friendly people. I think everyone's playing hooky too, right? They're supposed to be at work, working from home. This is their little break. The kids are at school, gives them something to do. Good morning. Give it about another minute or two. And just so you guys know, you know, I know you got a lot of you guys have been following us on a ton of webinars um, since COVID. Um, again, we will be uh, putting polls up there. The polls are really an idea, you know, to give us an idea of who our audience is, and also to help out Sharif too. So it gives them a good idea, you know, what level some of you guys are. So I know some of you guys are new, some of you guys are investors and been longtime investors too. Um, how many people have actually put it in the chat if you've actually seen Sharif when he's been here live? Well, I guess you're live right now, I should say in person. Uh, <laughs> God, put in the chat if you've actually seen Sharif when he spoke here at Bria the last couple of years. So anyone. And also, as we go out through the uh, event, yep. Yeah. Rena, yep. Of course, Ashley, Nicole, Martin, see, look. Right, right. So you, you, you got some followers. It's nice. <laughs> they must have enjoyed the presentations in the past. <laughs> Sandor, yeah, look at that. We got a few people. And and as most of you guys know, if you guys got questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, today is going to be interactive. Um, if you've noticed some of the things that we even put out today, um, I have Sharif doing a free bonus for us. A lot of good things. Uh, I kind of twisted his arm. Um, him being a, a, a big believer of South Florida and education, uh, his office is one of his offices, I should say, is in Orlando. Uh, we're also great friends, so I, I did twist his arm to give me a lot of free stuff. Uh, most of you guys know me. Uh, I'm a heck of a negotiator when it matters to our RIA, so I just want to make sure you want to stay around. Uh, also, I always get the question, there will be a replay. It will be on our YouTube channel. So uh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel too. So uh, again, all yep. And, and all our questions will please put them in the Q&A. So without further ado, um, you know, my name is Anish Dave. I am one of the owners of the Broward Real Estate Investors Association. Uh, Ryan Kuhlman, the other owner, is actually on vacation. He's finally taking a vacation with his family. So you're stuck with me today. Um, yeah, we've actually owned the RIA for almost eight, uh, actually six years. We've been with Bria and Miami Dade RIA for about eight years. Uh, one of the coolest things about running the RIA is we get to meet great people. And uh, Sharif was actually a diamond sponsor. I want to say for our big expo where we have about a thousand people, I want to say it was about four years ago, 
where um, someone recommended him and he killed it. Uh, so since then, we've had him come back a couple times. Uh, it's always a challenge because he is super busy uh, traveling all around the world, I should say, because, you know, even though he lives in Cancun, he's got offices in San Francisco, Orlando, and of course, his headquarters in Puerto Rico. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to uh, present, you know, Sharif Medawar. Um, first and foremost, not only is he a, beyond, uh, a successful fund manager, um, I actually count him as a friend now too. So, uh, and I've been luckily been working with uh, Sharif and I've actually seen him in Puerto Rico at his headquarters. So he is the real deal. So uh, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Sharif. Thank you so much, Anish. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm going to share the screen here for uh, some PowerPoints about the real estate fund. Uh, should I go right into it? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to actually kind of, you know, give an overview of who you are, I know I know you well, and we have sure. some people that know you pretty well too. So just your, your story of uh, how you got started. So uh, thank you. So I was actually uh, in my early 20s and uh, just finished college, um, studied hotel administration and finance. And my goal was to become a hotel general manager. So I was working at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles, California. It's a beautiful hotel. It's a Westin hotel. It was rated in the early 80s as the most perfect hotel in the world. It catered to presidents, movie stars, etc. So I was a management trainee there and I was running around uh, 10, 12 hours a day working. I wanted to learn everything. And one day a hotel uh, guest, a billionaire in the name of Edmond Besari, stopped me in the lobby. And uh, he said, uh, Sharif, I've noticed you're here from 6 in the morning to 10, 11 at night. What are you doing? Are you crazy? <laughs> and I said, sir, I... I have a golden name tag, you haven't noticed? I, I actually was identified as a potential general manager. They told me if I work hard for 10 years, I may make it to general manager. I remember him looking at me and he said, Sharif, I, this is crazy. How much does a general manager make? This is 1980. And I said, look, they make about 100,000 a year. And he said, look, you need to come and work for me. I'll show you what nobody can show you. I want you to speak on my behalf. I want you to do what I tell you to do. You have the energy, the enthusiasm. I've been watching you. People speak highly of you. Come and work for me. I didn't know what he's talking about. I was actually more scared than excited. And I told him, I said, sir, thank you for your trust in me, but I don't even know residential real estate to deal with international commercial and all these deals. And he held me by the shoulder and said, Sharif, you're at the right place at the right time. Just say yes. So I said, yes. And I went to work for him and the rest was history. I worked uh, till 1988. I left him in, at the end of 1988. I used to do deals for him around the world, in, uh, mainly in, in France and uh, New York and uh, Los Angeles. So I learned so much. And when I left him, I was 28 years old. So I started doing my own deals. I also worked for Hilton Hotels doing, uh, like when they're gonna lose their management contracts, I would go in, fix the property because I knew the real estate and the hotel business. And then, in, uh, then I decided to teach people. So in, uh, really in 1998, um, I started teaching people how to get residential and flip them, how to get into commercial. And by 2009, when the economy slowed down, I had a full-fledged education company based in Orlando, Florida. And uh, the students, you remember 2008, 2009, the economy was so bad. One of the students raised his hand in the training in San Mateo, California at the Marriott. And he said, Sharif, I've been watching your trainings. You do incredible stuff. I would love to do what you do, but if I make a mistake, I'll get a divorce. I didn't know what to say. I had all these people sitting in the room. I said, okay, what's your question? And he said, can I just give you my money and you invest it for me? And I remember just taking so aback. I asked the audience, said, okay, how many people just prefer to give me the money? And they raised their hands and they started smiling at me. And I realized at that moment, there are so many people that just are so busy in their life. They want to get into real estate in a safe, predictable manner. They don't want to be in the stock market up and down to average uh, six, 7%. They wanted some steady return that are safe and secure. So I set up the fund. Uh, the first fund I set up was in 2009, still up and running till now. It's called Mixif. And then we can set up a sister fund called Secured Fixed Income Fund because the law had changed and now we can publicly solicit like we, like we do in events and things. And what I will do today, I'll show you how it's pitched, how it's presented. 
And uh, the rest is history because it really transformed the way we do business. People can attend training and go do what I do or invest with me or just join me in joint ventures. So there's just so, the, the pie became so much bigger by giving back. And uh, so we've been up and running with the Security Exchange Commission filing with them for over 11 years now, and we're doing great. We've done great during 2010, 11, 12, when the market was down, still doing great through COVID-19, paid everybody as promised uh, August 31st, that we do the semi-annual payouts. And it's been a great journey. That's awesome. And, and you know what's funny is like, you're talking about, you know, the stock market. I just got to tell you, you know, especially with COVID and everything. And I'm always, I, I, like, I'm always chasing, uh -huh. especially what's going on. Oh, I should jump on this and try to buy some funds and do this. And let me tell you the ajna, like the stress, you know, before I knew it, you know, I'm, every morning I'm like looking at the market. Am I up or down? And, and then what, what it does, it, it, it doesn't keep me focused on what I do well which yeah. is more real estate too. So um, it is nice to hear something about a fund where, you know, uh, where it's secured also. Yes, yes. Uh, you don't want to be in the stock market. It's, um, it's legalized gambling. It's not that it's, it's, I mean, look, Warren Buffett did great, but then again, he buys companies in their entirety or has such a huge amount of shares that he has a say and a vote, et cetera, et cetera. Plus he pays no dividends. No, nobody can duplicate what Warren Buffett does. Warren Buffett never pays cash flow for the investors. He says, invest with me, and over time, the stock value will increase. And he even says, rule number one, don't lose the capital. Uh, rule number two, don't forget rule number one. What for us is different, I use a lot of his principles, but I say rule number one, you know, use the capital in a safe, cross-collateralized manner against real estate assets. Rule number two, make sure it produces very nice cash flow that's reliable and steady. We have to have cash flow. It's the oxygen of the financial world. Absolutely. So, oh, it's cool that you have some statistics here. So let, can I read them? Where are you yeah, yeah. investing your money, including your retirement funds, just starting to invest? About 20% of the people stock market, 26%, 25%, 24, maybe they're getting embarrassed. They're, they're moving out of the stock market as we speak. <laughs> Real estate yeah. trips and wholesaling, that's good. Long-term real estate, building a portfolio, 15%, money in bank accounts, it's pretty cool. Oh my God, CDs, about uh, six people. That's, uh, that's uh, if I may, I've noticed that in the world of investing, you have two types of people, those chasing alpha, like very high returns. So safety is very low on their priority. So they try to go for like these huge returns. They lose money, make money, lose money, and end up making less than the other type of people who are just super safe, and they go with uh, government bonds and uh, treasury bills, et cetera, and they barely make one to 2%. So you have these two extremes and the balance is to be in a fund, a real estate fund, if I may define it, versus a real estate syndication. A syndication is when you invest with somebody who is actually gonna take the money together and go get one particular property, let's say an apartment building, which is great. I'm not saying anything bad about that, but it's just, your money is secured against one property. If the roof costs more to fix it because there was a hurricane or something, they're gonna ask the investor for what's called a capital call. They're gonna actually see how much the cash flow is gonna be. They're gonna sell it at a certain price, share some of the upside. But a real estate fund like what I have, the investors come in as little as 25,000. Their money, or they can put millions, their money is secured and cross-collateralized against all the assets in the fund whether these assets are 50 million, 100 million, it can grow to a billion. This is huge difference when it comes to the safety and the steadiness of the cash flow. So real estate funds are where most people should look into it. And that would lead me into presenting my fund. May I? Yep. All right. So I want to talk about secured fixed income fund, which is actually... Uh, uh, by its own title, the money is secured. They get a fixed return, so it's reliable. They can rely on 6% or 8% return that they can compound or they can take and live off of it for retirement, et cetera. And it's a private real estate fund. It's filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission since 2015. This is when Obama created the Jobs Act and said, you know what? You can now publicly advertise your real estate funds. So we created this fund to be able to do that. So people uh, often ask, okay, so why should I invest with you in secured fixed income fund? 
The website is sfifund.com. You can take a look at it, see the assets and see what we do. Well, I want to tell you that I'll give you a bunch of reasons. Number one, I've been a real estate investor for over 30 years. Uh, I'm standing here in this picture in on Cristo Street in Old San Juan, Puerto Rico, where we own several mixed-use buildings. We own this one, for instance. We have guest jeans in it. This one, we had Crocs. Now we have Havaiana. We, I own 12 buildings in that street. These are my personal portfolio. We have some of my assets uh, under uh, the uh, my personal name and my my companies. We have also my real estate fund invest in that area, among other areas. I have been an educator and a trainer for over 20 years. This is very important because it's very transparent what we do. We explain very precisely how we do the deals, how we find the deals, how we analyze the process, et cetera, all the way down to how people get paid. And uh, what happens is the education company has been up and running for over 20 years now. Uh, as a fund manager, it's been over 10 years that I manage other people's money, millions of dollars. We've raised millions. I have a process to raise money. It's a very successful way. I've trained people even how to do it. We invest uh, their money. I mean, this is a group of investors that are touring with me, one of the properties. This is uh, a luxury home in San Francisco. This is one of the type of assets we invest in, luxury homes, people that like flips. We do the flips on millions of dollars. Buy a property, three, four million dollars. We add square footage and turn around and flip it for six, seven million dollars. Very profitable. We did flips as high as 12 million dollars. Same work you do on smaller scale, we do it on larger scale. We also done uh, actually Ohio properties that were as little as $40,000. Same work. Uh, and some even we kept them for rentals, but we're out of these because uh, it is a lot more money in the bigger end. We also have uh, um, mentored people and we've had uh, a YouTube uh, web channel uh, that uh, that people can actually learn what I do and understand those are kind of snippets and clips here and there so it's very transparent and again very accessible for people to understand what we do um, I want to talk about my mentor everybody has a mentor everybody needs a training to actually get to the next level and I was trained by a mentor in the name of Edmond Besari. He's the billionaire I worked for. This is a photo with him, uh, 1987 or 86, I can't remember exactly, in front of one of his uh, properties. His name is Edmond Besari. This is his uh, castle in France that he owned. It's called the Chateau de Madame de Pompadour, who is the, she was the mistress of Louis XIV. And um, it's in France's Loire Valley. It's two hours from Paris. This was the center of Europe, this area, and that was her castle. He bought it from the government of France. Here I was, his right-hand man. I'm standing on his left side, but I'm his right-hand man. And I handled these for him for eight years. He trusted me because I had the energy, the enthusiasm, and, and the integrity. He, that was very important for him. And uh, you can actually go on LinkedIn and put my name, Sharif Medawar, and you're going to see... Uh, an interview that I've had uh, about him and uh, Forbes magazine writing about his chateau that's worth 100 million. So it's a pretty fascinating guy. If you have the right training early on, it, it, it's great. And this is actually when he told me about syndications. The, the term syndication was known at that time and many years ago. And he said to me, you know, one day when you want to go from very good and performing very well to beating your unit of time, your unit of effort, and your unit of money or, or credit, you should create syndication and help many others like I've helped you learn. Help them because some people don't have the time to learn to invest, set up something for them. And that was really something that clicked in years later. Um, number six reason to invest uh, in a fund or with me specifically is my process is simple to understand and applicable in any market. That's the reason we're able to do so well when markets go down or stay same or go up. The system is five steps called the facts system. Uh, I show people how to find the right property and the right tenants for it. So it's a commercial building. How to find the right deals and how to find the tenants. I train people and I show them, and that's what I do in my fund, is how to analyze the numbers in a specific property intrinsically, what it brings and how it works in that market. So extrinsically, how it's performing in that market. Analyzing the trends for the market is very important. I, sh I, I actually use a system to control the negotiation and then the paperwork. Then I time the process of due diligence, the financing and the closing. And then I strategize to manage the property profitably and take it to its highest and best level. 
And we have assets like small hotels. We're doing two developments of hotels right now in Old San Juan, Puerto Rico, where there is such scarcity of supplies for hotels and there is such a need that during COVID-19, we're selling out every weekend and the government gave me a 40% tax credit to develop these hotels. It's just phenomenal when you know what you're doing in specific markets. We're filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. If you go to the website, mix it for Secure Fixed Income Fund, you can click right on the website, go to this SEC and see the filing. We like to follow the rules. We like to actually comply and be happy to show people in full transparency how we tell the regulators, this is what we do, this is how we're doing it. And, uh, my team is reachable. I always do trainings, not just for other people and invest with people, but my own team has invested with me. My own team works with me and they actually are reachable, available to network with investors, answer any questions in case I'm not available. I try to make myself available as much as possible because a lot of people want passive income. Actually, I see here on the list, what is the most important characteristic of investing in real estate? Passive income. You know, 40 to 50% of people want passive income that is safe. And, and that the fund is diversified. So I train my staff so they can also answer the right questions and everything. Uh, here is a picture of uh, some of our assets that we have currently. And uh, you can see we have the high-end uh, uh, residential over here that we take in San Francisco. We focus on San Francisco specifically because it's very limited market with high demand. The demand is always there. We're just listing a property now, 5.5 million. Yesterday I have a talk with the broker. It's at 368 diamond is the one right here. You should see it now that it's done. It, we're gonna actually have a website for it next week. And uh, the broker told me, she saw the bees broker. She said, you know what? We think we should list it at 6 million because we're, we're just off market. We're already getting demand. So San Francisco is an amazing market. So I wanna talk about what the fund offers and you can think of this and compare it to any real estate fund or syndication. Okay, so think about this as a business model. What do you look for? Number one is safety. You want your money to be secured against all the assets of the fund, all what you see right here. Number two, you want cash flow. We pay a steady cash flow, six to 8%. People put 250,000 and up, they get 8% steady. Liquidity, if people want to cash out, they're not stuck with us for five to seven years. We have a relatively great liquidity for compare us to any other private fund. People can cash out within 12 months. They just send me an email and I can cash out in nine days, six months. Within 12 months, they get cash out in full or they can cash partial. We have reserves. We always have money on the side for the rehab that we're doing. We have money to buy new opportunity. We have money because market goes sideways or down. We always have reserves. It's the key to success. We charge no fees. We charge no acquisition fee no management fee, no disposition fee. I make my money and the team make their money only after these are done, completed, and everybody's paid after the investors get paid. We have diversification. I can talk so much about diversification. We're diversified by type of assets. So here, for example, you see we have single family luxury homes. We have mixed use commercial, where downstairs is retail and upstairs is either hotels or offices, or medical or Airbnbs, et cetera. So we also have assisted living facilities that we're developing now. And we have a single tenant retail where we have all these um, uh, food retailers that come in and sign with corporate guarantees for long-term. They continue to grow even during COVID-19. So we're diversified by type of asset. So if you're taking notes, right, type of assets. We're diversified by location. We're in San Francisco, as you see it right here. We're in Old San Juan, Puerto Rico, because it's a great steady location, it's US. We also have other parts of the country where we find these single tenant buildings. And we also do assisted living in Florida and Michigan, which we're starting right now. Uh, actually, we're gonna close on some land within the next uh, 90 days here. We have it under contract. We're supposed to close very soon. So we're diversified by type of asset, by location, and we're also diversified by style of investing. The residential high end, we fix and flip. Always profitable, it's a simple formula. You add square footage, it costs you four to $500 per square foot, and the exit is 1,500 to 2,000 square foot. That's just San Francisco market. We've done it for over decades. Um, and uh, it comes to commercial uh, real estate, we buy them, we reposition them, and we hold them for cash flow steady in the fund. We do some developments and flip of commercial. 
So we're diversified by type, by location, and by style. I can talk forever about diversification, so important in real estate. And that's when COVID-19 hits, everybody comes running to us and say, okay, we sh I should have been with you because I'm in mean, this uh, deal and this is going sideways and this is a problem. Well, we are set up for the stress test. Yeah, and no hassle. Right. Be, what, what I wanted to ask though, like I always get this question, I go back and forth. Um, before the crash, I was up to 28 properties and then, you know, 2008 happened and got wiped out. And, you know, like we talked to a lot of investors here, right? And, and, and you can see by the poll, more than 40% was about passive income, right? Yeah. And, you know, so the question always becomes is, do you, you know, and I know you deal with a lot of high-end people where they have, you know, a couple hundred doors. Yes. And, and for me personally, as I'm getting older, <laughs> you know, I turned the big 5-0 this year. So is I'm more about passive income than doors, right? Because it always sounds great that you own all these properties, but then you run into, you know, repairs, roof, you know, like we're talking about, forbearance and eviction you know they're around the country we're looking at a lot of people not paying rent so I, I know like for me personally I'm kind of look. I'm thinking of doing a mixture you know yeah. so I've already invested you know close to half a million dollars of my own money in the fund That's and uh, yeah. you know and I, I have a little five unit building too so what would you tell people like you know the difference between order, ordering you know owning apartments or doors versus truly passive income like what you know is, I know there's not a right or wrong but I know you, you deal with a lot of people that uh that are high net worth what, what are you seeing well thank you for the question and thank you for the investing in the fund and the trust uh, that we have um actually a lot of people are professionals and they're busy like you have doctors I have doctors that are investors I have engineers software engineers people who travel for living etc and the easiest thing they see is I should put my money in the stock market. But what they don't realize is the stress with all the news. So they're constantly chasing news and all this. And it really takes what I call attention units. So you have so many attention units in your head to do business. And if some of your attention units are taken because you have to follow the news, you're worried, you're stressed, it adds to your overall what's called unfinished cycles of action. Because you're out there, you're exposed, and you have zero um, um, ability to really know how it's going to impact you. So that is very stressful, especially that if you average 8%, let's say in the stock market, like they say, if you stay in the stock market 30 or 40 years, you'll average 8%. Well, guess what? That's by reinvesting the dividends, number one. Number two, when you're averaging, if you made you know, 25% one year and then lost 25, you've lost so much, you need like 35% to recover and break even. So the average doesn't mean much because over three years of average, you may be just at par or you may not even recover. So that stress for professionals that have a good life going, they say, well, what's the best thing I can do? And then they discover real estate. And then they say, well, should I go into it? The biggest mistake somebody can make is a wrong assessment of expected effort. I have a spine surgeon who is uh, now an investor in the fund. And he started by telling me, Sharif, I got these three rentals uh, and I have these two properties that I'm gonna you know, go in and we're gonna rent them to Airbnb. And I told him, you don't have the time, you don't have the energy to do this, invest in my fund. If you don't wanna invest in, in a fund, I understand, but I'm just telling you and keep it as a thought in your head. Well, guess what? Seven months later, he calls me up. He said, I'm not even averaging 4%. I have complaints, I have issues. I'm doing the spine surgeries and I come out and there is a voicemail message I have to deal with. I don't have time. You're right. I'm selling my property. So it took him kind of going through hassle. Now, I'm not talking bad about doing real estate deals, but it's not for everybody. Not everybody should invest in passive income and not everybody should try to have that active ongoing income. And like you said, you have that balance. You have some properties, you invest in the fund, you know me, you know how steady and the income is. You've been to my property, you've seen, I am the largest owner of historic properties in Old San Juan, Puerto Rico. You've walked the buildings, you've been there with, with other friends and you know how it is. Yeah. So, I, and, the, and, and the funny part, I just wanna add, so some of you guys have known me through the years. My background, not only in my Indian, but I grew up in New Jersey. So I think everything is a scam, right? I'm just gonna start with that. So that's why I actually went down, <laughs> you know, not, not to take anything away from you, Sharif, uh, but I wanted to go down to Puerto Rico and actually see the buildings and touch it. So I'm one of those people that before I get myself, you know, in business with someone, I want to actually touch and feel 
So I think that's always important too. That was a big, you know, okay, the building's really good. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? Next week, actually, on the 29th, we're doing an open house. A couple of the properties are selling, so are being staged. And this is an inventory of close to $35 million there. And the, all the properties are one next to the other. So I'm inviting, actually, the, later this afternoon, we're preparing an email to invite the investors, those who can make it to San Francisco, come over, take a look at the properties. Let's meet each other again. Let's see each other in person, get to know each other more. And then they can tour what's going on. It's nothing like getting to see where your money's invested and where the cross collateral is, et cetera. So, yeah. so and, really and all, all investing start with the assessment of risk. And when the risk is reduced, then look at the cash flow. And when you figure out how the cash flow comes in, look at the liquidity. And when you have liquidity, you can cash out your money, look at the reserves. Do these people have reserves? Look at how much fees you're gonna pay to get in. Look if they're diversified in case something goes bad. Look how much hassles you're gonna go into doing this and look if that has any liability. That is exactly how I set up the fund because it's how I invest, it's what I teach, it's what I do. So, Absolutely. so you can see and, that. And Sharif, I actually got a question from Antonio. Sure. Did commercial acquisitions change because of COVID and did the allocation size of your commercial properties in the portfolios change? Is it more price conservative now? Okay, very so, good. So we focus a lot on single tenant properties. Those are the standalone retail properties. And a lot of people don't understand how it works. So I get people texting me uh, messages that say, but retail is going out of business. Look, like I got a text from um, a friend of mine who said, Sharif, and he sends me this. Um, I, I just got to see it, show you. He said, look, there is... Uh, the next economic uh, disaster, JC Penney's going out of business, retail spaces are empty. And I had to remind him, I said, I know you haven't been um, to one of my events to see what we're doing, but we actually focus on what's called QSRs, quick service restaurants. And this is the fastest growing segment right now. And these are retailers like take a Subway, um, Fat Burger, McDonald's, all these guys are growing because they're doing better. They want, uh, we focus on second, third generation standalone buildings. These are not in the mall because they don't want to be in the mall. They're saying, look, the main anchors are closing because people don't want to go buy clothes and jewelry there. So we don't want to be there. We want to be on a standalone busy traffic. So yes, things changed with COVID-19 and the market shifted, but this is where we were because we knew this is where it is and it has been steady for many years and growing in that direction. So statistically, if you go to a website called cpexecutive.com, they're explaining specifically that in the last four months during COVID-19, there has been a flight to the single tenant with the retailers that we deal with, which are the food operators. And what's happening is they are actually there is less inventory of these properties around the country. And uh, there is what's called cap rate compression. That means there is so much demand. So here we are growing in the single tenant retail, bringing food operators in. And people are telling me, wow, how can you make it? How can you continue having the cash flow? Because we know how the market works. And this is, this is what's happening. The trend is people want to get these they want fast food. They want it in drive through places. The drive through right. now has an area for pickup, et cetera. So I get very excited about, you know, where yeah. the market is and where we are. I, I think what happens with a lot of people is that they think commercial and they just put one blanket on it, right? Saying, oh, it's commercial properties. Yes. So JCPenney is very different from a fast food, you know, venue like that too. So um, I do have a question from Judy. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to mention something about apartment buildings. Now, apartment buildings are good but it's a lot more work. It's a lot of work. So you have to understand the work. Even if you put a management company, you have to manage the management company and you don't want the C-class because that's who's not paying right now. C-class uh, property, you want B-class, A-class. And the problem is you're paying such a premium for these right now. So, okay, go ahead. Yep, uh, I have a question from Jack. Also, are you or your team the operators? If not, how do you vet the operators? So how are you okay. actually managing? You know, I guess you could talk about each project. I mean, I know Puerto Rico. Yes. San so, so in San Francisco, for instance, I had the same uh, crew practically. My architect uh, who handles all this is very well connected with the city and does everything by the book. 
has been with me over 10 years. I mean, literally on the phone, we can talk five minutes, approved, let's do this, let's do that. Contractors have been with me. I have two teams actually, like two architects, two, but one main person has been with me 10 years. Uh, contractor has been with me one, seven years, one, three years. Uh, the other project manager has been with me 11 years. So those are the people that operate this. So they work directly with the fund and they get paid bonuses based on completing on time below the uh, pro forma, et cetera, uh, for expenses. When it comes to Puerto Rico, for example, I have a full team. I have uh, two lawyers in the office. I have uh, two CPAs because of the infrastructure we have. You've seen, you've met the team. I have a business manager. I have a small construction crew. Uh, when it comes to developing the assisted living facilities, we have a totally third party company and we fed them by showing, show me what you've done. Let me assess the value of the land when it's under contract, when it gets entitled because it increases and when it gets done, because now we have a project up and running and we're gonna sell it or we're gonna actually continue owning. So um, each type of asset by location and by type of investment, we have a different team. Great question, by the way. And uh, I want to just, I know you've got a lot of stuff, oh, but uh, sure. Judy, Judy had, a, yeah, Judy had a good question. What about the risk of loss due to acts of God? So I know what she's talking about, the hurricanes, obviously going through Puerto Rico. Like, are you worried about, you know, anything? I, I'm assuming that's what the risk when she's talking about the acts of God or anything else that might be happening with any of your right. investments. Okay. So you see this property in particular, this one right here, is it showing on the mm -hmm. screen? Okay, yep. So this address is 205 Cruz. So when the hurricane happened in 2017, uh, everything shut down for quite a few weeks. Old San Juan is built with these concrete buildings. The buildings are one next to the other. It's the oldest his historic zone on the US flag. I chose Old San Juan because of the location, because the type of building, these are historic buildings. So the older they get, the more valuable they become. Retail shops are very valuable there because it, they get traffic from cruise ships all the time. So there is huge demand and very scarce supply. So, and that was, I started investing there in 2003. By 2006, I owned a substantial portfolio and I kept adding. So that building, for instance, we bought it right after the hurricane, when the hurricane happened. So what happened is when the hurricane happened, people panicked. And that's when I moved forward. I bought seven buildings in 2018, seven with the real estate fund money. We moved a lot of the money there and we got them at least each one at a million and a half to two million below market. And how do you establish the market? Based on cash flow, not based on whatever some appraiser tell me comparable sales. I don't care about comparable sales. This one is producing X. This is who I'm bringing in. This is the upside. This is the steadiness and reliability of that income. And I buy. And that's how you don't make mistakes. You move forward. You get excited about moving forward when other people are, are afraid of trembling and moving out. I bought from people telling me I want out. <laughs> it wasn't a distressed sale, but it was a motivated seller. I just want out. I don't want to go through another hurricane. Okay, let me sign. Let me do this. <laughs> there was a guy, I bought two buildings from him. On the second building, he brought the lawyer to make me sign a paragraph that I'm of sound mind and spirit. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm having offers 2 million higher on that building. We don't want to sell it. It's good cash flow for the fund. So yeah, I mean, I know that you know Puerto Rico well enough. Most people would have ran you yeah. know, to see like, when it's a bad time and the hurricane, all the things that were happening, including me. And it's just not knowing. You know, when, you, when it's all about cash flow and you know, the funny part is when you do see Puerto Rico, and I, I went after the hurricane, obviously, and it was amazing how the buildings in old San Juan really stood, you know, the yes. test of time, I think. So I think it's always different, but it's like saying the U.S. versus, you know, Florida versus San Francisco. So when, when I always thought of Puerto Rico, I just thought of the whole island versus different parts. Yes, correct. So it's not just what I want to mention regarding the calamities of the weather and the idiosyncrasies of the people you deal with. It's not just about the strategy that I have. The money is actually in the structure. How do you structure the deal in a way that you have a very low downside and a huge upside? For instance, I optioned the buildings first. 
I have access to the building to make the changes. Then I exercise my option to close. So when I close, I'm already having the cash flow without putting so much money up front, number one. Number two, I use insurance for each building and cross collateral, and I have the best asset protection program in the country by far. And I can talk about that later. I don't want to waste time on it now, but we can definitely spend a few minutes talking about how I, I do asset protection to protect myself. So what ends up happening is I structure things right. The fund is structured right for the investor. I give them the cross collateral for safety. I give them the cash flow, the liquidity, the reserves, et cetera. And I structure the deals with the sellers and everything the right way. And I pay top dollars for the attorneys. I have in-house attorneys. So, so the advice and the research is constant and is ongoing. So that's key to, to survival. And the key to prosperity is if you've done everything right, the, the current and the trend comes with you. Okay, yeah, we're excited about this. Uh, I got a couple more quick questions and I'll sure. let you keep yeah, going. I love uh, the question. Uh, yeah, so do you have preferences? This is from Jack. Does the investor participation requirements to get the return similar or do they vary? So I, I, obviously he's asking about tier uh, returns. So okay, if so you want to talk about those kind of questions. Thank you. So it's a fixed return, uh, 25,000 to 249,000 is 6% return. Uh, somebody getting 1% in the CD would love to get 6% cross collateralized against all these assets. If they put 250,000, they get 8% return. They get more return and the payouts are February 28th, August 31st. Now, yep. can we make exceptions? Yes, we've had people come in with two, $3 million and saying, if I give you the money and not request it for five years, would you give me a little bit more on this list? And yes, we can with our private placement memorandum that's filed with the SEC, we have made exceptions. We had somebody come in with $3 million. She says, I'm committed for so many years. And this is how I want to roll my uh, interest and then get cashed out on X year. That's when I'm going to pay off this and pay off. And we made some individual exception, but this is for people putting several millions. Yeah, and, and I know I, I got a couple of private chats and can they invest in their uh, retirement account? It doesn't have to be just their um, uh, yeah. in a bank account? And, and the answer is yes. I can tell you that I've, I've sent my own money through Equity Trust. So you guys, if you guys are members, Equity Trust is approved with Sharif's fund too. So uh, yes, you can use your retirement account. Um, yeah. I did have a quick question. I know I don't want to get too far into it, but someone asked me about a 1031. Is there a trick to get out of the 1031 exchange and, yes. um, and, and invest in your fund? So... Yes, we definitely have a method for people to roll their money out of a property and into the real estate fund. It's, a, it's similar to a 1031 exchange. My fund comes right in the middle of the sale, gets the money, and then we complete the sale for the buyer. And the money sits in the fund and you have deferred the taxes based on the internal revenue code that has to do with installment sales. So for those who require that, we'd like to talk more about that. I will do a private session with people who want, it's funny how many people the last few months have been saying, I'm selling my building at X. I'm happy with that sale, but I don't want to roll my money into another building that I know is way high. And, and I don't want to be in real estate active anymore. Can I roll it into the fund? So we have a very specific way. We have a method for it. We actually have video to explain it. So if they don't get it right away, I show them step by step and we have attorneys that handle it. And it doesn't cost you anything, really. It just rolls your money and defers your taxes. So you get the 8% on the full amount. Now, the 8% you're getting, you're going to pay taxes on that income because that's just how the taxes work. But then when you cash out, you can call your money anytime. When you cash out, you've deferred the taxes till the day you cash out. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to do it. What a great question. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's kind of funny. The, the questions are just kind of rolling in. Uh, Majid was just asking, what's the difference between uh, your fund and a REITs and fees? So, you know, obviously the big thing is, right, the REITs, everyone's always talking about them and I want to yeah. be in this and fees and all that kind of stuff. So maybe just a distinction. And by the way, I know there's a lot of new people on here too, uh, new to real estate. So sometimes if the conversation's a little uh, advance. Don't worry. We've all been there. Um, so I, I want to let you know. The other thing is we've also had people, um, you know, if you're talking about, I know we're touching 1031 or any of these other things that we're talking about. I know Sharif's actually talked to their accountants, lawyers, all the above. 
Um, you got to remember, he is approved with the SEC. His booties on the line, I won't say the bad word, his booties on the line, he is not going to make any kind of mistakes out there, right? It's got to be a win-win when you're doing this the right way. So that's why he has uh, in-house attorneys, uh, tax people. Um, so he's been, you know, you know, fine tuning all these things out there. So great point. So I'll go back then and define 1031 exchange in case somebody's not aware. 1031 exchange is when you bought a property at X and now it's valued at a higher price. You've been taking depreciation and all this so that X purchase price, you depreciated. That means you wrote off a certain amount. So the cost basis has gone down. So you have all this as capital gain. And you can, instead of selling and cashing out and paying taxes, you can roll the money in internal revenue code 1031. That means you didn't sell, you just exchanged and got another property of equal or higher value. The problem is you still have to carry the debt forward. So a lot of people say, I don't want any more debt. I don't want to buy another property. I don't want to be involved in this. I don't want to pay the tax. How can I do it? So what we do is we actually come into the sale and we just buy the property at full value, sell it at the same price, and then we owe the money and make payments on the full amount. So we can help you defer it. You don't have to know about the mechanics right now. If you're interested, we can go into it. Now, I'll answer the other question. What's the difference between a REIT, which is a real estate investment trust, and a fund, which is a real estate fund that has many assets in it, many real estate properties in it, like mine, like the one I'm showing here, and a syndication, which is a private real estate fund that has just one asset, one property. Well, let's start with the syndication. Your money is secured against one property, so it's a little bit higher risk. You're usually committed and stuck for five to seven years, so they should pay you a little bit higher. They pay you some low cash flow and a kicker on the exit. Nothing is promised. It's not like it's going to be a promissory note. You're an equity investor. If it goes down, if it goes sideways, you have to invest some more, et cetera. So there's a little bit more risk and a little bit more return. A real estate fund is like what I have. It's, it, it's got more safety because it's got more assets in it. It's got a steady cash flow that gives you a reliable income and it has more liquidity. This is at least how I'm set up. Some, some have funds, but there is no liquidity. The REITs is the Real Estate Investment Trust. Usually these are publicly traded. So you're buying shares in a publicly traded REIT and some specialize in apartment buildings or retail buildings or hotels, and you can buy there and they actually have a stock price of, let's say it's a uh, hundred dollars a share and you buy a bunch of shares. Now they're going to pay you a dividend. Usually it's paid quarterly or semi-annually based on these REITs. When they pay you a dividend, usually you can see statistically it's between four to 6%. But the problem is when they pay you the dividend, let's say they paid you annualized 6%. They can drop this share value from $100 that you paid. It goes down to 95. So now you're like, oh my gosh, I was going to get my 6% and cash out my money. But now my shares price drops. So they get you to stay longer. <laughs> and they tell you you have liquidity. And you can Google this and look at how REITs work. And you'll realize people that go into REITs, real estate investment trusts, they're buying stocks. Really, that's what it is in the stock market. And they're at the mercy of whatever they're going to invest the money. It's called the blind pool. You don't know what they're going to do with the money but they pay you a dividend and the price of the shares fluctuate usually with all the economy. Our share prices do not fluctuate. Even when that you put your money from the IRA, it says it's 25,000 a unit. You bought 10 units, you put 150,000, you're getting 8%. We pay it right into your IRA. You want to you wanna reinvest it? You want to compound your money? You can do the math. 8% on a compounding calculator for about 19 to 20 years makes it about 20% a year. How do you like to make 20%, which is the compounded return per year, if you stick it for 20 years? Look how the money multiplies. If you understand compounding, compounding works for the financial world, for your knowledge, for your relationships. You never interrupt compounding. I can talk so much about compounding diversification. Oh, it, it's, it's funny because that, that's what got me. As soon as you, I, you know, I did being a number guy, check the math. And of course you were right about that. So for me, I, I, that's, that was one of the reasons why I invested right away. I was like, yeah, I wanna make sure the, you know, the power of com compounding and, and then I don't have to worry about it too. So I do have a question from Eduardo. Do you have to be an accredited investor to invest in your fund? If not, what's the percentage quota of non-accredited investors allowed in your fund? Do you wanna first actually explain what an accredited investor is? Yes. I'll put a quick poll up there too, so. 
Very good point. Thank you. So an accredited investor is somebody with a net worth of $1 million, excluding their primary residence. So don't calculate the equity you have in your primary residence. So you have $1 million in valuations of, of assets you have out there and net worth, then, then good. You're an accredited investor. It doesn't matter how you made the million dollars. You inherited it. You want it. You, you, uh, you have a million dollars in net worth. You're an accredited investor. You can go into this type of fund. Uh, also, if you if you don't have the one million dollars, there is another thing. It's or you have two hundred thousand in income if you're single, or you you're making three hundred thousand in gross income as a married couple, or you know together with your spouse, and you file taxes together, and you've had that three hundred thousand for the past two years each year, and you expected to make the three hundred thousand this year as well. So you're accredited. If you're not accredited, we can get to know each other. And we can take about 30 some non-accredited investors in our sister fund. But we got to get to know you first, you get to know us. And there are certain rules to follow for non-accredited investors. So we have really a way for people to participate in that. But we have to follow certain rules by the SEC. Perfect. OK, I'm going to hold off on the questions for a little bit. Um, I'm going to let you kind of, um, those are some good questions. So I just figured I'd yeah. you know, jump and into. You know, when I go through this formal presentation, we can take questions. I, I love the questions. You know, it's it just uh, awesome stuff. All right. So the core team has been with me for over a decade. That was actually a question that was asked. As I mentioned, architects, uh, contractors, all this. these people have been with me for years. My team in the office, I mean, uh, one of the team members has been with me over 20 years. And I have co-sponsors. I mean, you, you are now a co-sponsor in the fund, uh, Anisha, as you know. And, you know, everybody grows we grow together and we contribute to each other's success and we contribute to the communities where we invest in. That's the whole idea of life is can I grow and how much can I contribute? If you actually want to even value somebody's um, worth in life, it's not in how much they are, their net worth is it, but how much they can actually contribute in life. What's their value to others in terms of what they bring to them. Now, not only people, investors come in and they get, to benefit from the cash flow they get and the safety, et cetera. But we have other areas of expertise. We explain asset protection. We have tax reduction programs to bring people the taxes to 15% flat. We have tax uh, uh, 31, 1031 exchange into the real estate fund we talked about. We can work with retirement funds. So, so the key thing is to understand there are a lot of opportunities and ways to, to invest with us and grow with us. And my own money, my family's money is in the fund. We have a proven track record through various economic cycles. Like I mentioned, 2008, 9, 10, 11, all this, the market was going down. We we're still making money, paying on time. The market came back up and now flattened down. We have a huge competitive advantage and sustainable business model because of the momentum we have. I have relationships with brokers, bankers, team members. That comes with years. It's easy for me to talk about that now when the fund has been in business 11 years performing. And I've been in the business 30 years performing in practically the same markets. So uh, we earned each one of our investor success stories. People can go to Mixif, our sister fund, Mixif.com, and you can see success stories and uh, from many investors that have been with us for years. Um, and uh, anybody interested, I invite you to go to SFIfund.com, click on Get Started, fill out the needed info, and, and just follow the step by step. There is a purchaser qualification questionnaire, something about you. I make this, I am this, this is my information. There is a qualification questionnaire acknowledgement. Yes, this is me and the subscription agreement. I hereby would like to subscribe to buy one share. What if somebody wants a fractional share? Let's say somebody has 37,000 and they want to invest the whole 37. They buy one share, 25, and then fractional share. So they can just put that in the subscription agreement. I respond, I have a team of people that review this and then we actually give them the approval. And if we have to work with their self-directed IRA, we do it. So it's a pretty simple process and that's how we get it done. And uh, if you have other questions, I'm happy to do it, but I'm also happy to do a 15 minute consultation. Now, you know how crazy my time is, but I have promised you that for the Brea group, I'm gonna do this to schedule a 15 minute Zoom call with me, use a link or the chat box below. Uh, I don't know, do you have the link? Like uh, it could go on the screen where they can click on it to schedule if they want. 
or they can call Absolutely. Nicole so, at this number. So, so I already just put the link in the chat box, guys. Um, again, just so you know, we uh, Ashley also put uh, information about the 1031. You could easily call the number or go to his appointment calendar. Again, Sharif's time is valuable. So what, what we're asking, if they're just super general questions and you're new to investing, maybe that's something that um, you know I could help you with or our, our staff. Um, if you're already looking to invest and know more about the fund, uh, 1031, um, you know, uh, Sharif's team is fantastic. So there's, the, you could also email me too, and I could always forward it to his team because I know one question turns into about 50 and, and that's for everyone, including myself. So a lot of the questions I could probably help out with or his team, but if you're actually, you know, Hey, more about the 1031, about the fun, definitely book your appointment with them so far. Um, but I know I'm, I'm already getting questions about the tax incentive. So okay. The bonus, like the, the, uh, they're asking me more about, okay, great. <laughs> what is this tax incentive thing going on in Puerto Rico? So okay, maybe so we can touch on that. Awesome, awesome. So Puerto Rico, as uh, many of you may know, is a US territory. So it's part of the United States, but they don't have the IRS, they have Hacienda, which is the sister of the IRS. So they're allowed by Congress to set up their own tax incentives and, and ways to attract investors' money to come in there, et cetera. So, they have a couple of programs, one called Act 22. You can write that down and Act 20. Act 22 is if you personally go and relocate to Puerto Rico to live there, you take your spouse, you take your kids or take yourself, your business and move it there. And then another one is called Act 20. When you're there now and you're physically resident of Puerto Rico, um, which has some residency requirement by IRS code, they have to be there for three years, 180 days a year, etc. cetera. Um, you then have to also apply for what's called Act 20, which allows you to export services outside of Puerto Rico to anywhere in the world. And when you have income, you pay less taxes, so long as you maintain certain staff number of professionals, you have a bona fide office, you do audits every year for that entity. Itself. So there are these structures that for anybody making 200, 250,000 in good income, net income, you can benefit a great deal because you can drop your taxes tremendously. Now, we also have a way for you to benefit from that without physically relocating there. We have a way, a legal way for you to get some consulting services from me because I have the Act 20. I am approved to export services. You will benefit from some, what I call tangible service of, of consulting. And then when we actually work with you, we can drop your taxes to 15%. Now, because this is kind of private and personal for people, those who are interested in this, please schedule a time with me. I promise I will get to know you better. I will tell you how it works in details specifically for you based on your type of income, if it's capital gains, if it's a high income from a business. Those I can't help are two types. Um, number one, those who won the lotto. I can't consult for you to win a lotto. I can't uh, help you with that. Uh, and number two, those who have a job and are on W-2. So on the W-2 part of your income, I can't help you drop that taxes. But any other endeavor, entrepreneurial endeavor, if you're licensed, uh, professional, if you're an investor, we can help you drop your taxes. Most likely 99% of the people in that category. We have even tax opinions. I will show you the decree from the government, which is the contract with the government. So it's a call that has to be on Zoom. I get to see you, you get to see me, I get to show you the documents, but we can definitely drop your taxes to 15% flat if you're an investor making 200,000 plus. Yeah, and Sharif, uh, just to add on to that, I know you have a client out of uh, California, I believe he's a CPA or ex-IRS guy, I'm not sure. Yes, or... he used to work for the Franchise Tax Board and he's a CPA, he's experienced in this, he checked the law, the code, and he's actually one of the clients. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and I know, because I know we have some accountants on board that are listening in today too. So this is just the bonus, I would say, to make you look like a hero. Um, the other thing is, I know sometimes if you're not sure, like I'm, you know, I'm not a hardcore tax guy. I've been using the same accountant for about 19 years. So I know you, you're you open also to do a Zoom call with your accountant or your legal team or whatever you know they need, I guess, is really um, 
you know, to make them feel comfortable. I don't know what this is probably the easiest yeah, way to say. Absolutely. I mean, imagine uh, somebody making um, just on every 100,000, somebody, let's say, is paying 30,000 in taxes. And we drop that to 15,000. So they're netting an extra 15,000. And, and now instead of netting 70, they're netting 85. So what's, let me calculate that. So that's, if you take that 15 extra, 15 extra that they're netting on the actual, instead of 70, so it's 21.4% every year net extra on every hundred. If they're paying like in California, 40% plus, that's 41.6% will put in their pockets every year. And the money goes to Puerto Rico, which is the intent of the law, is they want it, they want some money to come to Puerto Rico because economically Puerto Rico was not doing well. And um, they wanted to put less aid money, let's face reality, from the government to Puerto Rico. And they say, if we create these incentives, that's what's going to happen. And what happened is a lot of billionaires went to Puerto Rico to take residence, like John Paulson and um, the Putnam Fund, this other big fund, and many, many big, big players. And you can Google this and look at it. It's just too complicated. The law is in Spanish. Uh, you have to have attorneys and all this. But we simplified it, and we have attorneys in-house. We have CP. Actually, one of my CPAs used to work for the Treasury Department. So we, wow. we, we will show you exactly how it works. And, and if it works for you, we're happy to help. Heck, hopefully you can invest that tax on a million dollars. We save you 150 to 350,000. Maybe you can invest in the fund, in that money. And then compound it, right? So the turnaround. And then compound it. If, if, if it's a million dollars, I mean, I can't do the math as quick as you, but yes. if, if I was saving 150,000 a year, and then I compounded and I did it for five years, yes. and I'd be retired a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm calculating a 30% tax. Most of the clients are paying a lot more than that. I mean, if you have capital gains and stuff, we can also help. But it's very individualized because we have to check the box on a few things and make sure it works for you and it makes sense. So we are and, always in the safe zone of what the intent of the law is. So. Yeah, and, and I know you actually have it from, it's the Hacienda, right? The, the Congress, the yes, letter actually, that shows that, that letter yeah. is from the government. This is a decree that means a contract with the government, and it's a 20-year contract that renewable for another 10 years. I'm, I'm actually right. officially a Puerto Rico promoter. I have to take uh, yeah. apply for another application, show them what I do. Of course, with my large uh, Puerto Rico Old San Juan historic buildings presence, I mean, the buildings that are valued, uh, between, I don't know, around $80 million, if not more. Obviously, I had the presence since before the tax incentive law that came in, so I was grandfathered in on a lot of things. So it's a very unique way to help people and, and help them grow, whether they invest in the fund or just we want to help them, we're happy to help. Yeah, and, and I know you worked with one of the premier uh, accounting firms in the U.S. and yes. uh, the most expensive letter that you've ever spent at a- uh, 5,000 for one tax opinion. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you want to just talk because you know what happens, right? Everyone says it sounds too good to be true. How, uh, you know, I, I mean, you have the decree from the Hacienda, but yes. um, you know, you want to talk about what you did for like how you met with Grant Thornton and yes, what, so, so what I did is first I, I met with the government people to explain to them that we I had some clients mainly in California that were not going to relocate to Puerto Rico. Actually, these clients didn't know Puerto Rico from Costa Rica. When I would go back to California, how was Costa Rica? I said, I'm in Puerto Rico. It's part of the US. What are you talking about? Of course, now a lot of people know about Puerto Rico. It's been in the news for hurricanes, been in the news for these tax incentives, et cetera. So a lot of people said, well, this is very interesting. Puerto Rico can help me drop my taxes, but I can't live there. So when I explained to the government people, I said, well, is there a way you can allow me to do certain things with these people to drop their taxes? And it took several months and they came back and said, okay, you do it this way and this is the way it's gotta be done. And so we, I had to retain an, a CPA in uh, first in Silicon Valley for the high net worth people to prepare some documents with the IRS. And then another CPA that I've known, he studied it and he said, this is great. I wanna use it myself. And we started helping people. And for the last five years, actually, we've helped several people that were able to reduce their taxes legally and reinvest in the fund or invest more in the fund. And um, individuals that benefit from this are usually licensed professionals. I've noticed licensed professionals and um, uh, that want to invest in real estate or want more cash net so they can buy the building they're operating from or the office condo they're in. So that's really the, the, the gist of it. Yeah. When it, I went to- 
Huh? <laughs> Let me take the was, story of the plant. Huh? Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. Go okay. Ahead. Thank you. So I went to Grand Thornton, which is one of the biggest accounting firms in Puerto Rico, and they said, okay, so here is the law in Puerto Rico. This is based on Congress. Congress makes the law and it's enforced by Hacienda and IRS. And then they had me go to the Miami office for, for them to actually fill out the documents over there as well. So these trips and these two letters between IRS and Hacienda, they combined the tax opinion letter showing this is the law, these are incentives, this is how it works. And it was extremely beneficial for yeah, all. It, absolutely. And I got like some of these questions. I mean, I'm, it's gonna be a little bit rogue what I'm gonna ask anyway. Yes. Um, we do have a, an election in two weeks. Right. So surprise, surprise, surprise. Um, what do you think about, you know, without really being political, so I'm going to keep it off it on that. I'm more um, about the tax structure. Like, what do you think is going to happen, whether it's Biden or Trump, you know, with the tax incentives or the tax structure? What, what How do you prepare yourself? That's probably the easiest so, way. So Trump already in 2019 uh, made some changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, last year, 2019, it was early 2000, they made some change. So we adjusted to that. And actually, it's pretty good. Um, if, if Biden wins, you're going to need our tax incentive structure. If uh, Donald Trump wins, you're going to need our, our asset protection structure. So with one, <laughs> with Biden, you're going to need our tax program. With Trump, you're going to need our asset protection program because after COVID, people are getting angry and they're suing and all this. For me, I honestly would tell you, I, I believe, uh, uh, am I still coming through okay or did I freeze? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I honestly would tell you, I really think every, every president that came to the United States to be a president had the best intentions. It, the job is not easy. You have a lot of negative forces that fight you. So I wish the best luck, may the best man win, like they say. And we are prepared for either because we, we're already set up for a stress test. With, with all what we have done through the years. So I'm okay with either. I, I, okay. I really don't understand all the political details to put it yeah, in mind. Me mind. either. I, I mean, it's the same thing. I know like the world's a little bit crazy, you know, with COVID and all these other things. And, and I know you're still cash flowing on your properties in, yeah. in Puerto Rico. I, I think one of the things that I know, um, he's got some massive tenants, like whether it's Puma, Coach, they corporate yes. guarantee it. And I'm not gonna say yes. they have endless amount of money, but they pay. So I think that's always important with the fund is that you have cash flow properties, you're building, you know, assisted living facilities, you have reserves, and then you're also building high-end or or upgrading, renovating houses specifically in San Francisco at specific areas. Exactly. So it's not just like, hey, I'm gonna choose San Francisco altogether. You know where all these guys are coming in and buying and and um, spending some big money too. So, I mean, I, I think it's diversity. Like if I may add, for example, to explain, if anybody doesn't know what that is, a corporate guarantee. So I took a building, for example, and it was in Old San Juan, and I put it under contract, and I brought in a big tenant. And the big tenant, these are national tenants, publicly traded companies. So when they sign the lease, they want 10-year lease. They sign it triple net. That means they're going to pay the lease is 20,000 a month, net of property taxes, net of property insurance, net of property maintenance. That means property insurance comes in, I send it to them, they pay. Property tax bill comes in, I send it to them, they pay. It's triple net. So I'm getting the 20,000 a month net. And every year there is a 3% escalation. And on top of all this, they give me a corporate guarantee. That means that lease is guaranteed by the entire corporation. So for 10 years, I don't have to worry about anything. I receive the rent directly deposited in my bank account or the fund's bank account. They pay the property tax, insurance, handle the maintenance, and 10 years, and it keeps increasing. 10 years later, they want to renew. We, we, during COVID-19, March 15th to, to the end of April, many of the tenants had closed. There was a curfew, you know, the, the country was in disaster, the world was in a disaster. And guess what? Coach paid me in full. Everything got paid. They just paid, the, they, they got delayed in paying because we couldn't reach anybody in the office. And then they called me, so okay, where are you ex? We're sending the bill. Why? Because I have a corporate guarantee. I can go after them and the banks that gave them the credit line. You, you see how it's structured, structures where the money is not just the strategy. Compare that, that if I had an apartment building and I have to chase individual people who got fired and all this, you have to have a heart, you have to work with them. So 
yeah, big difference. So what I'm going to do, because I know you kind of touched on the asset protection, I am getting a couple private chats mm -hmm. about that. Do you want to touch on, you know, the asset protection that we're oh. talking about? That, that's okay. So, so the asset protection, basically, I'll give you the idea in a few minutes. Let's say, um, I'll use it, a big example. Let's say I was talking to this investor in New York and he said to me, I don't need asset protection. I'm set up with these trusts and all this. And I have LLCs. And he's got this apartment building, $30 million apartment building, 10 million equity, 20 million debt. Are you with me? 10 million equity. And he said it's in a separate LLC because that's how his lawyer set him up. So I said, okay. I said, this is how I would set up. The way we do it is we set up a Wyoming LLC. It's in Wyoming. And to capitalize it, to fund it, to put money in it, we say, I'm going to put $10 million. So I owe you $10 million. And we create a promissory note that we record against that apartment building as a secured note. So now the building will have a bank loan of $20 million and a note secured against the property for $10 million to capitalize an entity. Both loans look like liens against the property. They're mortgage liens. And now if anybody's trying to sue this person and they're gonna look and search, they're gonna see he owns the apartment building, but guess what? There is no equity to go after. So they settle with his insurance. And if they wanna go beyond the insurance and continue suing him and win in court, what ends up happening is it's a charging order that comes in, but the charging order, if they force him to sell the apartment building, 20 million will be paid to the actual uh, bank and 10 million to the Wyoming LLC. There is nothing to collect what they will actually get is a what's called phantom income tax bill. They're gonna say, you want a case, you want 10 million, you owe taxes of X. So this is the kind of a nutshell of 60 seconds, the asset protection that Wyoming LLC can strip the equity of as many assets as you have, or as you want. I have 33 commercial buildings. I can strip the equity on all 33 commercial buildings. Yeah. So I'm gonna to add to that question, right? So the first thing, you know, can I ask you for, I'm sorry, yeah. can I ask you for just one second? I have to do something over here. I have to open the door. Is that okay? Yeah, sorry. absolutely. Give me one okay. Sorry about no that. Problem. So, so in the chat, guys, give me a thumbs up or hell yeah, or something that you're understanding what it is about the asset protection. Um, one of the, the cool things about what, you know, Sharif does, uh, when he comes back, I'm going to actually ask him about uh, how, does he buy, how does he buy his properties? Right, so we always hear all those uh, questions. Should I buy it in an LLC? Should I buy it in a land trust? Um, all the above. Oh, Leandra, thumbs up. Eduardo, Jose, our accountant, thumbs up. He loves Wyoming. Uh, Juan, excellent information. This is what we like to hear. What do, does does everyone also understand um, the tax incentives in Puerto Rico? Uh, I know it's a ton of information, so. Trust me, when I was first uh, um, looked at all of it, I didn't understand anything. And luckily, you know, Sharif's more than patient enough. I asked him a thousand times some of the things about the asset protection. I asked him all these things about the tax incentive. Um, I'm super thorough. So, yep, Leandra, she understands it. Rebecca, looking forward to the replay. Uh, make sure, also, we're, we are putting in the chat, if you guys want to, you know, schedule your call, uh, make sure you um, um, go in the chat. You guys can give a quick call or he's got a calendar invite in there. So where you could actually see what his schedule looks like. One of the things I do want to make sure because of time, it truly is 15 minutes. So I'm going to kind of set this up. Don't make me look bad. Meaning I know Sharif is beyond energetic, entertaining and smart. Don't waste your 15 minutes on, you know, asking them all these other questions that have nothing to do with anything. Um, if there's some things that I could help you with, again, I, I've gone to Puerto Rico. I've actually trained with uh, Sharif for a weekend and got a ton of this information. So you could also use me as a resource too in, in that case. Uh, Sharif, what I was going to ask is, you know, we always get those questions. I know you have those commercial buildings, right? So I always yeah. hear, right, the, my, okay, if there's any attorney friends on here, you know, I want you to sign off. Um, you know, should I buy it in an LLC? Or I know the way you buy your buildings and your properties. How do you, what entity do you buy them in? Okay, so um, I have some buildings in my name and my wife's name, and I have some buildings that are in LLC. 
Yeah. It so so I just want to clear. I just want to clear. If you guys heard that, right? He actually has buildings and properties in his name. So I always get yes. that question all the time. It's got to be an LLC. Sorry. Yes, preferably in an LLC. I'm okay with both. But the thing is, I buy. Um, it doesn't matter what entity you have your properties in. When we do the the uh, Wyoming LLC and record for you liens against your asset, it doesn't matter. You don't have to transfer ownership out of your name or your your um, uh, LLC's name. So whatever ownership you have, it does not change. It makes it very simple. One Wyoming LLC can strip the equity on all the assets you have. Now, the reason I bought some in my name, because when you prepare your financial statement for an entity, you have to put the purchase price you paid and you have to put minus the depreciation you've taken and now the reduced actual amount of that asset. But when you actually prepare a financial statement for yourself, personal, you put, I bought it for 4 million, but now it's worth six and a half million based on this cash flow and this is what I've done for it. So the actual difference on the financial statement personal versus entity is huge when it comes to banking relationships, uh, statements, et cetera. I'm protected either way because of my asset protection program, the insurance structures I have and all what I do. But that's why I, I can explain to people both and we can talk to any attorney and challenge them. Heck, uh, my asset protection program sells through attorneys. We, we present it and sell it at $5,000. Attorneys sell it on platforms of seminars at 15 and fulfill it to our offices. So we know we're doing something right. Yeah, and, 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 and I did get a question about it. So it starts at 4,995, right? And you also get one lien. One lien included. included. Every additional lien is charged 695 separately. If they have many liens, we'll give a discount. We try to, yeah. and it's very simple. Very simple, actually. When you sell a property, let's say one of the property you're going to sell, and escrow, the title company calls you and say, we have the payoff amount from the bank. What's the payoff amount that's owed to the Wyoming LLC? You say, that was to capitalize an entity. You send them by email the certificate of ownership. There is nothing owed. It's, it's tax neutral. There is no tax impact. It's yep. so long, I want to put a caveat here, so long as the Wyoming LLC and the structure is set up, at least a day before the incident. You don't go have a car accident, which is number one liability in the US, car accident, and then you run coming to us, say, hey, can I set up uh, the Wyoming LSE asset protection? And the website, by the way, is called KMAGB, kissmyassetsgoodbye.com. <laughs> and, and we have an animation video that explains it. Uh, yeah, we, we could do that, and I could always send you guys something afterwards uh, for that information too, so. Um, and and I, Antonio did ask uh, who wishes the note and who's the owner of the LLC in Wyoming. Okay, and so the Wyoming LLC owner, we suggest always to be a living trust. And we, we include that. We work it for people. We will usually charge separately, but for Brea people, we will include the trust set up. This, you know, yes. alone is worth a lot. And we will include it. Um, my team, I know, is listening to the call, so they know we will include it for you and and what happens is the living trust will show you and your spouse as beneficiaries uh, and then something happens to you it goes to your loved ones so this way you're in full control you have protection it is not a substitute to having insurance is to supplement the insurance this is how i have peace of mind when i do my trainings my here i expose all my properties my real estate fund is set up protected we protect the investors and everybody's able to actually have peace of mind and sleep at night yeah and, and the thing like you know what i always think that's important is especially what you touched on is the lending portion yes. right so if you buy it in a land trust there's going to be less lenders that are going to let lend on it if you buy it in an llc same thing the loan to values change and yes. the interest rate goes up so i think you know if you buy it in your personal name obviously you can leverage that the most um, I think the other big point is that you don't have to transfer the, yeah, the, uh, the I mean, LLC into something else, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, yeah. So you don't have to worry about those deed stamps. Right. And, and I think it was the challenge and, and, and you have everyone on your team, meaning if you talk to the lawyer, he tells you one thing. If you talk to the accountant, he tells you something else. Yeah. And then you got to figure it out on your own, what your risk level is number one and to be most protected because the last thing you want to do is own property and all your cash flow goes out. 
because yes. you're you're spending so much on accounting services or legal advice that at the end you're not really you know what you thought was an eight percent return right let's talk about that if you thought it was an eight percent return after expenses it really isn't and, cool. and i think that's always a little bit different too and and since you know you're you're really good at this and i always hear this sometimes which is funny it's like you know i bought a house for 150 you know 15 years ago and i paid cash mm-hmm. and now it's worth you know 250 mm-hmm. and they said oh i made a hundred thousand dollars mm-hmm. and what i realized is that they, most people don't count inflation right, is number one on the return. Number two is they don't count the repairs. Oh yeah, by the way, I had to change the roof, there was vacancy. So if they look at their net yield, it's a lot of times less than 8%, especially down here in Florida. I don't wanna say, you know, it depends on what part of the country you're at. But what I've yeah. seen is you're banking on appreciation. And sometimes, you know, appreciation is, you know, like I'm always conservative about it meaning I'd rather use three to 5%. I know sometimes it's up to 10%, 15% because you buy it at a good price up front, but you still want to be conservative to an extent, you know, on some of your, your investments. So, I, you know, what I found for myself, like I was definitely, uh, especially 2007, eight, like a hardcore risk guy. I'm like, yeah, I want maximum return, maximum. And as I gotten older, like I'm looking to diversify. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that I've learned from you because, uh, you know, you're one of my mentors is that, you know, diversifying in locations, you know, or assets or, you know, makes a big difference, you know, on that yes, portion. Sure. So. I have a couple of friends who had syndications in apartment buildings and the entire business model was based on them increasing the rent so they can flip it five years later. Well, guess what? They're in the fourth year and now you cannot do rent increases on residential when, when COVID-19 is going on and kids are sitting at trying to do school online and your job is telling you maybe you can stay at home. We don't know if we need the same workforce, et cetera. So that business model, compare that to what we do where we rehab luxury homes with huge demand is practically, you can look it up. You can Google this. In San Francisco, there is such scarcity of supply that the properties are not lasting two weeks on the market. Still right now. And or, or take properties that have corporate guarantees with big companies that are publicly traded. So I, I'm able to get the cash flow, et cetera. So, so it's very important to understand what am I really getting into? Do I know what I'm doing? Do I have the time to handle it? And if you do, great. You will make more than the 8%. There is no doubt in my mind. But then do the proper math. Let the numbers speak right. for themselves. Yeah, I mean... You know, for me, it's kind of funny because COVID, you know, is challenging. And then we even had this conversation before was that it made you rethink everything. It made me pivot. You know, I've been doing great, you know, wholesaling houses, fixing them, but I was losing money on the back end, meaning I was paying way too much in taxes, right? Yeah. So you, you work so hard, you know, to make the money. And then I always joke about you want to keep it legally, you know, so now I'm actually even buying certain things in my self-directed IRA. Yes. And I'm also putting money in the fund. So it, it, gets, it gets me diversified. And uh, Colleen did ask, uh, yes, can investors fund through self-directed IRS? The answer is absolutely yes. yes. Uh, you know, it, it's pretty easy. Uh, they worked with a lot of different uh, companies out there. Um, so it's pretty easy on that portion too. Um, I guess one of the other questions I also do get is if they put money into the fund, uh, do they get interest right away or how does the holding period or yeah. let's say uh, somebody is uh, approved on a Friday so they fill out the paperwork online they go to sfifund.com fill out the paperwork whatever and we approve them and they send the money in on Monday as soon as it shows up in the bank account Monday evening the interest start accruing Tuesday morning so interest accrues the very next day just like depositing in a bank and that's how we set up the fund Immediately interest accrues at the six or eight percent. It has the liquidity. It, it, they get a promissory note showing all the assets that it's cross collateralized against, and they filled out the proper paperwork for the SEC and regulations, and um, and and then they uh, have no fees. We don't charge them any fees. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always think that's, you know, um, I'm, we're almost out of time. I don't know how fast everything always goes when we're always <laughs> chatting with you too. Thank um, you. What, do, what do you think of, you know, like any parting? Because I know we have a lot of newbie investors. We have some experienced mm-hmm. people. Um, what do you, and, and you've been through, 
I don't know how many crashes, right? You've been in real yes. estate and also- Oh, I remember. Uh, yeah, in 91. Yeah. In 91, when the economy went down, believe it or not, every time there was a crash, it the way I positioned things, it worked to my advantage. Now, I hope that continues. I think now I've learned from structures how I actually do it and make more. I mean, 1991, when the Gulf War started, I was in San Diego, California, and I realized all these renters can actually buy homes if I get the home and sell it and carry the financing. And it was amazing. And then again, in the, I remember September 11th, in 2001, when all this happened, they announced they're going to actually lower the interest rate and print money and do this, this. I said, oh my God, it's going to be a bonanza of real estate. And I started investing. It was amazing. In 2008, 2009, I was buying homes in bulk. We made the most money in 2008, 9, 10, and 11. It was unbelievable. And now in COVID-19, we're doing developments of assisted living facilities right when they break ground. So we get in, the property value already has gone up a million to two million. So we have no downside. And why? Because the developer is not able to get the same loans and he knows me. And these relationships, sometimes you're like set, planting seeds. Uh, but anyway, uh, my last thing, uh, words of wisdom, <laughs> like you said, <laughs> look, the three things anybody wants to do is, and in terms of the financial world is number one, you want to make money. We have a way for you to make money. We have the investment up and running. We have history of performance and we're happy to disclose and share everything with you openly. If it works for you, great. Number two, people want to save on taxes, reduce their expenses. We have a program. We'd love to share it with you to see if it benefits you. And number three, they want to protect their assets, their home. They don't want to complicate their life, their investment property or business. And we have the method for this. It's pretty simple. I wanted it to be simple because every one of the programs is something I set up for me. I paid a lot of money with attorneys to crack the code. That's what I do. I worked for a billionaire and I used his systems and methods and I was able to actually be set for life, just repeating. And, and, and then when I realized I had students that wanted to do it, it helped me expand. And we grew the pie for everybody to benefit. And if people go on YouTube, you'll see over 2,000 video success stories. I'm the longest running education companies and investment companies with these success stories. And these people have known me for years, would love to get to know you. Anish, thank you so much for giving me that uh, opportunity and, to talk to your team. And, and, and one of the things I would just add on to, just in general, as we're doing a lot more webinars and COVID's happening and you know the fear of you know, what, what you don't have control of, you know, you guys got to let it go a little bit. And, and what I tell people is you don't want to wait until the sidelines, right? Like you wait on the sidelines. Life is going to pass you by. So it, it, it's really about action. And, and that's what you really want to do uh, with your real estate career. You know, if you want to buy houses, you want to flip those. But, you know, for me, you know, I'm at the point where I'm looking for multiple streams of income. Yes. So if something's not working out so well, <laughs> I still have some money coming in. So I think that's one of the things as, as you get older a little bit, you become wiser. Hopefully you don't make the same mistakes. I know I haven't. And um, also Ashley just put in the chat, just so you guys know, um, we do have the phone number on there. If you do want to book, go ahead and book your appointment. They are filling up. And, uh, you know, for me, I just want to thank Sharif uh, mm -hmm. for even taking the time. Uh, all the way from Cancun, um, mm -hmm. you know, spending time with us and giving us a bunch of freebies, by the way, which I totally appreciate. And today we just kind of touched on so many things. So the replay will be there. Again, if you want to set up the 15 minute call with Sharif, if you want to email me, I could tell you the process uh, myself personally, as I've invested my retirement account, uh, we practice what we preach here. And uh, hopefully you'll also get a, a, a link from us Hopefully you'll give us a five-star Google review on Sharif's performance. If not, I'm going to find you. No, I'm kidding. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank everybody. And uh, we do have upcoming events next Tuesday. Uh, Bob Pepe is going to talk about insurance. He's one of our local vendors too. So hopefully, um, you know, we wish everyone to be safe and healthy. And uh, we'll stay tuned. And uh, again, I want to thank Sharif for um, giving us a ton of great free information today. So thank, thank you, so you guys. Much. Have a good time. Yep. Have a good night. Good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>